you want to start and land, you can go make money doing this most places if there's transactions happening. It's just don't try and do it everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. With a whole bunch of different types of land. And then once you've picked one or two places, really drill down with uh, finding a good local expert that knows what they're talking about, because otherwise you can get yourself in trouble really quickly. Hello, and welcome back to the Very Real Estate Effect podcast, a show dedicated to real estate investing. And today, it's a pleasure to have my friend Dan Haberkost on the on the show. Uh, he's the founder of Front Range Land, based in uh, Spring, Colorado Springs, Colorado, USA. Hi, Dan. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Axel. Excited to uh, dive into it today. Yeah, absolutely. So before we we jump into it because i want to share your story i just want to remind everyone thank you for sharing this episode with a friend who could benefit from this conversation we're going to be talking about land and land development today and a number of things that dan has experience in and i'm sure there's people around you who could benefit from this conversation so send them the episode tell it tell them to listen to it and of course if you have any questions or comments send us a little message we try to respond to everything we get so dan before you got into land, you started with rentals. Like how in the world did you get started in real estate investing? Sure. So uh, I worked uh, for a number of people through high school and college where I ended up running and managing their businesses or aspects of their businesses for them. And so as a teenager, I managed a farm and I, I managed his rental properties while he'd spend a good portion of the year in Aruba. And uh, that taught me all about the real estate I did not want to own. Uh, you know, see properties at best, very old vintage houses. A lot of these were old farmhouses and uh, that was awful. And so I, I didn't, as a 16, 17 year old, appreciate the value of real estate, but I knew if I was ever going to buy rental properties, it wasn't going to be like those. So did that through high school and college, uh, worked while going to school. The last couple of years of college, I worked full time at a landscaping company, managing the residential side of the business, selling the work, managing the guys, responsible for growth, gross margins, all that sort of thing. And so I was doing that in conjunction with full-time school. And that that wasn't fun. All I did was work. I did not have any fun in college, but around 19, 20 years old, I thought, okay, well, what can I do to take this experience and apply it once I'm done with school to start some sort of a business, do some sort of investing to put myself ahead, ahead of the curve uh, as an adult. And so I started reading different books on equities, different businesses, just anything and everything. And like pretty much everybody else, it was rich dad, poor dad. That was like the light bulb moment where real estate it is, right? And so bought a duplex at 21 while I was still in college, just as a simple house hack. Uh, and then decided I didn't want to stay in Ohio. So I moved to Colorado here, bought another house hack. And at that point, I realized the uh, the low and no money down stuff for actual buy and hold rentals, it doesn't really work beyond a few small acquisitions, right? If you want to buy a substantial amount of nice real estate, you got to make money. It takes uh, and so, <clears throat> yep, yep, exactly. And and even, you know, I've done a few no money down seller finance deals and there's things that are going to go wrong. You still need cash reserves for rental properties. That is just reality. And so I thought, all right, well, I hate having a job. I, you know, I still had a job at the time. We're talking 2018. So how do I start some sort of business to uh, scale my income, get out of a job and, and buy more rental real estate. And so that's ultimately where front range land came from. So met a guy at the local real estate group here, which I actually host now who had been doing land and development the last 40 plus years. I'd go down an hour South of Colorado Springs there where he lived and helped him in his business every weekend, help him work for him, learn from him, whatever I could. And eventually I slowly started participating with him. And so he was doing infill new construction. Uh, a lot of it uh, pre-sold, sometimes on spec, but simple infill new construction. And so that was my first foray into land and development. And uh, so eventually I started sending out postcards to help him get more lots. And maybe I'd assign it to him for a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks or uh, helping him with the builds and, and learning there. And so ultimately I took that business model and ran with it. And so Front Range Land today is just a giant marketing funnel going direct to seller for land much of which is simple infill. And a lot of it, we just buy and sell or buy it and do simple improvements and resell. And then a few lots at a time, I'll put new construction on. 
uh, the, the simple arbitrage is all over the country, a lot of it in the southeast, and then all the new construction has been here in Colorado where I can kind of keep my eyes on it. So that's where I'm at today. And I've been continually buying rental property since then. And so I, I think of kind of two categories, two buckets. There's the active business, right, where I can scale my income, the land and development. And then there's the buy and hold real estate. And the buy and hold helps reduce the tax on the, the active. And then the active continually feeds the acquisition of more rental property. So that's where I'm at today. I'm 28. So I've been doing this for a while, even though I'm fairly young because I started pretty early. Wow. There's so much to unpack in here. Well, thank you for laying it down for us. Um, one of the first places to start. So in Canada, we don't necessarily call them infills, mm -hmm. um, land development. Can you just kind of define to make sure that we're all on the same page when we start? Sure. So the implication of infill would be similar to shovel ready or developed horizontally speaking, right? So many people misuse the word raw land. They don't know what that actually means, where this is not raw land. This is land where, you know, whether it's a lot between two houses or a street with six lots built out and then six more lots available, all of the entitlement work is done. It's already been subdivided into a nice little square. Water, sewer, power are all right there. And so I don't have to do any of that sort of improvement work. I don't have to go through a process with the county to or depending on the municipality, county or metro district to get uh, the approval to go build a duplex or a house. It is already entitled for that. It's a use by right. And so I just have to submit plans and go through the simple review process. Uh, and so these lots are very, very easy to build on, relatively speaking, no extension of utility. So that's the implication of what I when I say infill. OK, so when you say that you focus on infill, is that you buy lots that are already um, serviced that already have utilities or do you buy a big piece of land and then you draw a road and then you subdivide it into 20? Uh, where do you start? Yeah, yeah, focus almost entirely on infill. These failed subdivisions from decades ago have been incredibly profitable. And so it's kind of interesting. Uh, the market I do business, a lot of business here in Colorado, it was uh, for anyone that knows Lake, Lake Havasu down in Arizona, same developer did the same sort of project just 10 or 15 years after Havasu. He was following the Army Corps of Engineers. And as they dammed up the Colorado River and, and created reservoirs, he would do subdivisions by those reservoirs. And uh, Lake Havasu went pretty well, but he went broke on, on Pueblo West, Colorado uh, years later. And so it left thousands of infill lots with all the work already done, streets, roads, water, sewer, power, right? Uh, it was mostly unused. A small portion of it had been built out. And it sat pretty dormant for a long time, but in the last decade, you know, Denver and then Colorado Springs have really, really grown. And so the progress has just been pushed right down the main highway, right down the front range and Pueblo's grown a lot. And so that market has really picked up, slowed down again here with the interest rates, but uh, markets like that, that's kind of the archetype that I have found time and time again, all over the country where it was a big subdivision, lots all sold to out of staters. And then for whatever reason, it just didn't really take off. Uh, but now uh, growing rapidly. And so I have examples of this in Florida, the Carolinas, it's all over the country. There are these sorts of projects that kind of failed initially, but now are really blowing up and those have been yeah. really profitable. Well, and especially as you say, if all the work has already been done, mm -hmm. the, so the infrastructure and the roads are already in place? Everything, yep. Wow, okay, so yep. then it's just a question of coming back and marketing those those mm -hmm. lots to, so they start to sell one by one or you sell a lot of 10 to a, to a builder. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll we'll sell a couple, but uh, again, it's it's all a matter of going direct to sellers. So we're getting onesie twosies all over the place. Uh, you know, got one in in a market in Florida that we're splitting into two, right? So there's simple improvements that we can do like that. Uh, looking at some bigger pieces to potentially uh, uh, do larger subdivisions on, but I always I, I, I look for the simplest and and most headache free way, you know, to profit off of a deal. And when I look at because I've watched friends of mine do huge subdivisions and, and a lot of entitlement work. And you've got to be very careful where the county can, <laughs> if you're not capitalized right, if you can't hold for an extra two, three, four years, depending on what you're doing, they can totally, can hammer you. totally yeah, ruin your project. So yeah. anyways, with everything, I, I, I try and eliminate needless complexity and, and keep capital turning as quickly as possible. So, okay. So, so then, as you said, you're essentially a large marketing funnel yeah. where you market to those infill owners who haven't built. Um, mm -hmm. And then is there still margin left on it? Like for you, for you to buy it and then sell it to, to an end user who's probably in the end, just someone who's going to build a house to live in. What, what kind of margin are you looking at? All the time. 
So 50, 60% margins is very, very common. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, well, with land, so many of these subdivisions have gone up, especially in Florida. Florida's gone crazy, uh, where by a 10x multiple from when they bought it, sometimes 20x multiple. Uh, so a lot of times you well, we're looking for a specific avatar and they tend to be financially pretty comfortable or well off. Uh, they bought it a long time ago. They bought it at a basis of pennies on the dollars or what it's worth mm -hmm. now. They don't want to deal with realtors. They don't want to deal with listing. They just want it off their plate or yeah. there's complex easy, easy transaction out. Yeah. Or, or there's an awful difficult probate to go through and you know, we've got a great attorney for that stuff like that, you know, so it's, it's just solving problems of different types. And sometimes it's as simple as convenience. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then kind of walk us through the, 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 the process that you use to be able to market to those lots that are those infills that are ready to go. How does it work? Well, I pull the data from PropStream. It's quite simple. Usually if I'm, I'm marketing to a new market for the first time, I'll start with the low hanging fruit, which are 10 plus years owned out of state, out of county owners, you know, in Florida, even like three plus owned and prices have gone up dramatically since then in most of these markets. Uh, and we'll send them mailers, we'll cold call them. Uh, and it's just a giant funnel, right? And so my guys know how to, to screen and disqualify people. And that, and that's the frame that I look at every real estate deal from, because I look at so many every day between my personal business, the stuff people are sending to me to fund, uh, uh, what's the quickest way to disqualify, right? And, and so I have found that to be a useful frame because especially when you're new, it's too easy to get excited quickly about deals yeah. and make bad decisions. And so, especially today with looking at so many, I think of it the opposite of everything's not a deal until I can prove otherwise. And so I, I start by, if I'm looking at something, all the reasons that this wouldn't be a deal. And if I can't find any going through the due diligence list, then, okay, this might be worth actually taking a really serious look at. Okay. And what are the markets that you particularly focus on and why? I personally, this is just opinion. It's not right or wrong. Uh, I like the places that are very competitive on the buy, but borderline liquid on the sell. And so, so like a lot of Southwest Florida, we're listing these things and they're under contract in 24 to 48 hours at or above ask all the time. Uh, and those are my kind of markets because it's, again, it's very competitive on the buy, but we get deals all the time. And then if they just turn, turn, turn. So I prefer that over the opposite where there are places that it's very easy to buy at a discount, but sometimes it might take you six months. It might take you two years to sell. Now, to be clear, this isn't a dichotomy all the time. It tends to be a, a spectrum, but I have for brief moments in time found places where it was very easy to buy at a discount and sell, but that's never lasted. The secret gets out, uh, but always looking for places like that, of course. Okay. And what are the trends that you see going on right now? Because obviously, in, you know, I think in the US too, right now we're talking about the housing crisis and the need mm -hmm. for more new builds. So that's something that must be really good for you to capitalize on knowing that you have lots that are severed and ready to go. How have you been using this new trend to favor your business? Sure. So I didn't fully answer your last question. So to be clear, uh, I've really slowed down in Colorado because Colorado has slowed down, still doing yeah, some new construction here. Uh, and then Southwest Florida, uh, mm -hmm. North Central Florida, and then uh, all over the Carolinas have been very, very profitable. And so to that end, the trends I'm seeing are these cheap markets where there's huge amounts of people and jobs coming, yet you can buy a new construction home for 250 are just going crazy. I mean, a lot of these markets are indistinguishable from 2020, 2021, just an absolute frenzy seller's market because there's so much demand. It's so relatively speaking affordable uh, and so much money is coming there. And so the, the housing crisis, of course, has been very uh, a good time to be in land because the, the beginnings of all new housing, of course, is finding a place to put it, a piece of land. Um, and so that also speaks to what you know your recent guest Mason and I are doing with Ground Up Partners as well. Uh, we can get into that now or later uh, because the land space is incredibly inefficient and very not well understood relative to other assets and especially given the demand. Can you be more specific? It's interesting what you just said. Land is very inefficient. What do you mean by that? Yes. All right. So this, this is fun to talk about. Going back to when I told you in college, I started reading all these different books. And I remember reading in the context of equities, the stock market, about the efficient market hypothesis. And the yeah. whole idea was 
all right, you have millions of rational players looking at the price of stocks every second of every day. And so prices will reach intrinsic value because of that, right? That was the, the thesis. And we know rational is the, the wrong keyword there. Humans aren't rational. We're very irrational, emotional animals. But the stock market is far more efficient where it's very hard to buy at a discount. I can't just go on and find something 50% of market value, right? That That's yeah. really hard to do. Now, within the context of real estate, this, this concept has stuck with me. And I think of, or I liken apartments or a lot of commercial real estate to being a lot like equities where you can buy at a discount, but it's not easy, right? To go get an apartment at 50 cents on the dollar, there's got to be serious distress or you're solving some crazy title issue or something, right? That's that's not easy to do. Land is not that way. Land is very inefficient, not well understood, not very e efficient marketplaces. Yeah. Most realtors don't want to touch it. And so this creates opportunity in a variety of ways, uh, but it also just makes it easier to get a deal on one way or another because there's far fewer competent players not well understood and just all around under underappreciated. Yeah. And it's interesting because as you share that, I really like this idea as well is that for, for apartments, for condos, there's just a lot more comps. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot. You can assess the value a lot easier for land. There's no two pieces of land that are alike by definition. We don't make more of it land, uh, except there's so many different attributes and also mm -hmm. just according to where it is in the development cycle. Has it been severed? Are utilities available? And and you know we all know how land is valued. Is the value of what you can build on it? Mm -hmm. And so it's you're you're absolutely right. Like there's a lot more opportunity in imperfect pricing with land than almost any other real estate asset class. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And then to that end, I, nobody really provides capital for land at scale, barring uh, construction loans that include the purchase of the land. But those are contingent on soon you know actually doing the construction and so that's a whole nother opportunity uh but I'll, I'll pause there and we can go in whatever direction you want sure well i actually like okay so for people that are listening to this i'd love to get into into land what would be some of the first places to start because you know we all hear like oh you can invest halfway across the country you can buy a piece of land mm -hmm. in colorado if you know you live in california and this and that yes but realistically people who are starting they want it to be within like, you know, a one or two hour radius around from their house. They may have, let's say, 30 to $50,000 in capital. How would you advise someone to be able to start in that industry? First, I would pick a niche because that's a huge umbrella land. I have friends down in Texas that all they do is they take old ranches and they split those up into big parcels that they sell as hunting tracks or large estate sort, tra sort of tracks. I've never, you know, I touch mostly uh, 10,000 to one acre uh, lots. I've done hundreds of deals and that's been more of my niche with some outliers. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's land that's purely recreational. There's land, you see point being, there's a million different opportunities. You can go to DR Horton, figure out what their buy box is, go get the track and improve it to the point of being ready to sell to them and, and make a killing that way. Um, so don't conflate all these different options and all these different asset types uh, because that's how you can get yourself in trouble because the, the rules and heuristics definitely vary dramatically. Um, so I personally would probably start if, you know, given the description you just gave, maybe 30 to 50 grand with recreational or infill. Uh, pick one. And then if you're in Manhattan, you're probably going to have to go further than two mi you know, or two hours from your house. Right. Yeah. But if you're in the Western United States, there's a bit more land. It's a less developed, you know, relative to New England. Uh, and then pick a couple markets and, and create a funnel in your mind where uh, you, you call realtors, you do some due diligence on all of them and pick the one that, that feels best, both on price point, demand, complexity of the due diligence. Um, but one important question that's just, this drives me nuts because we get all these submissions to fund deals from people who have not done business where the deal is yet and they haven't talked to any locals. And if there's one piece of advice I can give you guys, yeah. I've done business in like 20 plus states it varies dramatically around the country and you have to find a local expert. And the question to ask is Axel, if I've never done business here before, this piece looks good, but is there anything I could be missing that I wouldn't know as an outsider that's applicable to this market that could get me in trouble and see what they come up with. And let, let me give you an example. So if you don't have a sewer line, you put it in a septic tank and the codes, you know, at the local health department vary dramatically from place to place. So Pueblo West, Colorado, where I, I 
first learned about this. I did my first builds and everything. Uh, you generally could sell land and, and buy it that didn't have sewer without any sort of soils test because it's very homogenous. The soil, some places a little harder to excavate, maybe small engineering to the septic where it's a little more expensive, but most people didn't care. And it wasn't a big consideration. Mm-hmm. Where I'm doing business in the Carolinas, it's it's life or death Fuck. where well where you get too wet and it oh. won't per, it won't percolate, percolate and so yeah. people will not touch lots that haven't had a successful at least preliminary perk test and for any builders listening yes it's always solvable there's always a way whether it's with fill or engineering to make a lot perkable but it's kind of null because a lot of these markets aren't expensive enough for that to ever be justified so for all intents and purposes a lot of these middle class markets if it fails a perk test it's worthless and so I didn't know that originally coming from Pueblo West, where it's just not a big deal. And so these are the types of things where you, you've got to talk to the locals and find out the specific things in that market that really matter. I, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, local realtors have helped us get deals and avoid bad deals where we yeah. wouldn't have known it because we didn't realize, oh, that specific street is the desirable one amongst all the others. And it's worth twice as much. Mm-hmm. Right. And so. I know I ranted a little bit there, but the reality no, no, is no, it's, it, you need that, that local knowledge. And I'm, I'm thinking of like, oh, there's a beautiful lot. It's like, yeah, but across the across the road on the other side, they're just about to, about to put a landfill. It's been announced last week. Yep. How else would you know? Like, yeah, you can look at the yep. news. But so, yeah, no, you're absolutely right that having the local knowledge always helps. And you can't have the local knowledge everywhere. So you have to ask um, a domestic expert. Yeah. And, and what I wanted to I want to bring that full circle and say, if you want to start in land, you can go make money doing this most places. If there's transactions happening, it's just don't try and do it everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. With a whole bunch of different types of land. And then once you've picked one or two places, really drill down with uh, finding a good local expert that knows what they're talking about, because otherwise you can get yourself in trouble really quickly. Yeah. So there's a lot of guys here that buy big parcels of land. I mean, it's Canada. We have lots of forest. Mm-hmm. You know, let's say one or two hours out of town and then they they essentially do a severance they'll take it they'll cut it up into 20 they'll draw a road and then they and they incite people to you know buy a plot and then either they build on it or they hold on to it for six months a year and then they flip it for for, for a profit um is that something that you would recommend as well yeah absolutely it's a great strategy i've got a piece that was uh in ohio sent to me today looking at taking it and splitting it up into four pieces and, and selling off them individually because guys think about this right it's it's the wholesale to retail if you go and buy go to costco and you buy a massive pack of, of bottled water you know it's x per water whereas if you go to the gas station you want one it's 10x per water uh, it's the yeah. same concept as you split it up more and more right you tend to be able to sell at a higher margin per you know acreage Okay, so then for you, in all the different options and exits that you see, you've done a lot with uh, with end fills. Do you mm-hmm. build actually some yourself? Yes. And what so, I see you, uh, I don't mean Dan. You take the hammer. Yeah. Like, do you yeah. work with a contractor to develop and do the uh, small, like you know, whole yeah. whole streets of I call them the photocopied homes. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I have done it with simple infill consistently for years where just onesie twosies. So mm-hmm. broke ground last Friday on a duplex in Pueblo West that I'm just going to keep this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so guys, this can be really profitable and fairly passive, or you can go broke. So you got to be really, really careful here. So I'm glad you brought this up where I, the amount of contractors I know that have been arrested, that, that were arrested, arrested. Oh, oh, it is By so the police bad. Arrested. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So what? money, fraud, drugs, oh. domestic abuse, all kinds okay. of different problems. Okay, you have to be yeah. really, really careful here, especially in these second and tertiary markets. You know, if you're in downtown New York or Los Angeles, that's one thing, but the level of competency tends to go down as you get in smaller markets. And so where I'm building in, in, in Pueblo, um, it's been very profitable, but if you hire the wrong GC, if you don't set up set really clear expectations on who's doing what what happens if we go over budget time frames you know you can get yourself in trouble with the hard money loan or whatever sort of loan you're using and you can be stuck with a half-built asset that nobody can refinance uh so all that to say we can go into this as as detailed or or not as you want but uh it can be very profitable but you, you need to make sure incentives are aligned and expectations are very very clear 
Okay, so how does someone make sure that it gets profitable instead of going broke? Like, what are the three or four takeaways or common points that you see with those who succeed? Sure. So I'm not going to speak to what it takes to go buy 100 acres and build 500 houses. I've never done that, no. right? So don't ask me. But for simple infill, start by buying the land at a discount, right? That helps just add padding to the books and then or to the numbers. And make sure that that lot has all utilities in place. Topography isn't a problem. If the soil needs to be considered, do that ahead of time, right? You want it to be as easy as possible to build. And so 989 Harmony Drive, it, we broke ground on that last Friday. It's perfectly flat, easy access, water, sewer, power, are all right there. It's zoned for duplex, but it's surrounded by nice single family and it's got killer views. So great lot for a, a build and, and hold. I don't want to sell this one. Uh, so that's the first step is making sure the land is ideal. All right, so that's done. How do I find a contractor? Well, I want contractors that have successfully built in that market for years. They're not new. Uh, they've built a similar product, right? If, if they're building single family houses and you want to go build a strip center, I would caution you there if they've never built a strip center, right? So they've built the asset you want. You've seen them successfully build these sorts of assets. They have a good reputation. They've been doing it for a while. And I'd like to know they're financially solvent, right? If they, if they say, Hey, uh, I need you to, to pay for everything on the spot. I can't, they can't send you an invoice. They're not able to front anything. That's a problem in my mind. I want to see that's that. That's a major red flag. Yes. Yes. So watch out for that. So do your screening and then ask for a bid. Hey, this is the approximate plan I want to build. What can you do it for? Right. And so I get bids from three, four or five contractors. And then from there, you just further, you know, go through the interview process and make sure, do they want to build for an investor? Well, I mean, the value proposition on my end is they're not building a home for me. It's not my, you know, I'm not emotional about it. It's, hey, build this simple, pretty commoditized product. Yeah. I'll disperse the funds like that and it'll be easy for you. You don't have to deal with the banks. You don't have to get the land. You don't have to deal with a, a needy client. And some contractors are excited by that and then some are no i want to build the most expensive thing yeah, and i'll deal with margin them. yeah yeah and so figure out what they want uh and i personally don't like cost plus for for anyone listening cost plus is where i say okay axel i'm going to build you this house uh for whatever it costs plus 20 percent, 15 percent, whatever and that does not align your incentives then they get paid more if it gets more expensive i i do not like that so you need to- uh, uh, So how do you I structure it? Is it a fixed price? Yeah, so I've done it two ways. With this one, it's a fixed price. Uh, and then in the past, when I was selling the end product, I did uh, profit splits. So then our incentives are very aligned. Uh, the way I learned to do this through my older buddy at the time, he would get the land and finance it. And then he had a whole network of realtors he, who would have advertised a lot. They'd get a pre-sale Bank would finance it 100% because it's pre-sold with a, a non-refundable earnest money deposit. And then him and his contractor would just split the profit, putting everything in at cost. And so I did that a number of times. I really like that model, but that's only if I want to sell it. If I'm keeping it, that doesn't work, of course. Um, so continuing along, get your bids and then and set expectations. All right, this is what you're going to get paid. Um, and then you need a contract, right? Don't ever do this without some sort of written agreement. Oh yeah, contract, yeah. a written contract with clauses and penalties. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and you can give them upside on the flip side. If they, you know, if your expectation is six months, you can say, hey, if you get this done in four, I'll give you an extra 2%, whatever it might be, an extra 10 grand, whatever. Um, and then get, uh, of course, you need your lender. Uh, I personally like, there's a local hard money guy that's lent to me for years. I use him. They make it so easy. These mm -hmm. local banks, they want 20 or 25% down plus the land. They're very slow and tedious. I personally would rather the more expensive money uh, and not have to deal with that pain in the butt plus yeah. the extra down. So that's how I do it. And you've built um, credibility with him if, if he's been lending you for years. So and yeah. now he, he trusts you and it's much easier. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's another thing, Axel, just everything gets easier over time. The longer you do this, there's so many things that build up. Just, you know, I heard someone say trust uh, lubricates deals, right? It's so easy yeah. to get deals done. You know, I'm buying a, a couple of fourplexes with a partner and he's one of the first people I've ever partnered with. Uh, so at this point, I just tell him point and shoot, hey, send half, we're buying these. Yeah. Don't even have to think about it because there's such a trust built there. Uh, but anyways, continuing along, uh, from there, it's it's really simple. If you did your due diligence, you bought the right piece of land, you set up 
a proper agreement with the contractor and set expectations, then you're just dispersing the draws and, and getting those draws from the uh, lender as you go along. And a new new construction is very, very simple uh, when it comes to just you know duplexes or single family homes. It's just a simple box with some infrastructure. So anyways, on Harmony, we excavated last Friday. Uh, I got pictures yesterday. We should be pouring the footers today. So moving along. Nice. Very encouraging. And just, just to go back to your agreement with the, um, the the contractor. So you always go on a fixed price or a profit split if you're going to dispose of the property afterwards. Um, what are two or three other things that you would recommend people they do? Like, I always want references. And I said, give me three addresses that you've built recently. I want to go and see them. I want to talk to the owners. I want to go talk to whoever was responsible for the build because you always learn. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there that you can think about? Because I feel like there's a lot of people who either got screwed or feel like they got screwed by contractors. And it may not be just for full build. It might just be like, oh, some home renovations and they mm -hmm. they cost a lot and the quality wasn't really there. So I just want to give them tools so that doesn't happen again. Yeah. So like you said, seeing that they built the same or similar product in the market. And so using who I'm, I'm using this exact example, I saw her, it's a father daughter team. They're both contractors. And I watched them build the same exact duplex around the corner i walked through them with her she's partnered with a friend of mine and that has gone very very well and so okay. he referred them to me originally that's how i came across them and that that really helps when somebody is in your network um there's an accountability knowing that you all know the same people and do business with the same people that creates a certain level of accountability um so that helps but uh or, and so if they're referred by someone you know and trust that really helps so look at their projects look at how long have they been around uh can you get referrals has someone you know and trust use them and then in this specific case one other thing that made me optimistic just about incentives is they're doing an identical duplex on a lot i sold them actually uh down the street at the same time and so of course they're going to have the guys oh, perfect. Perfect. yeah you already see what i'm saying yeah, that, yeah. it's the synergy is it's perfect they know exactly what to build it's a yeah. photocopy just a block away yep Yep, exactly. And then they're also incentivized to move quickly because they have interest taking on their build. Uh, so that helps as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Great advice, man. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's always fun to uh, it's always fun to have these conversations. Now, Dan, if anyone would like to uh, reach you and know more about you, what's the best way to do so? DanHaberkost.com or on any of the socials. And then if you have a land deal that you need capital for, GupLand.com, which is G-U-P-Land.com. Do you find any uh, deals in Canada? I don't. I've never been asked that. I don't know the legality of that. So I'd have to uh, talk to my CPA first. So uh, no, as of now, but. Uh, yeah. Okay. It might change, but as of now, just deals in the U.S. only. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. We actually have a lot of listeners. A lot of Canadians now are buying in the U.S. because Canada is, it was rated as now the second most expensive housing market in the world which is Jeez. really terrible news. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyways, we'll see how that goes in the future. Dan, it's been a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And for all those who are listening, again, share this episode with a friend who could benefit from this land conversation. And as usual, educate yourself, do some research, and make some offers. Thank you, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.